This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. Not sure what happened to my freak heart intro thing. Normally it's, uh, I've got the little hearts that come down, but they seem to have disappeared. I'll have to reset that up at one point. Your diagnosis is a long hauler? Are you, you be, have you been battling uh, the coronavirus? Man, why don't they just give you some antibodies? Thanks, Barbara Smith. You know, get the stuff that uh, the Trump got. What was that called? Uh, Regeneron or some shit. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened in my, my freak heart uh, things that would come down. I'll have to go try to find that somewhere. Yeah. How did you get uh, vaccinated? Are you, you're, aren't you like a medical person? I wonder if I could get vaccinated. I got some medical history I could throw out there. <laughs> Yeah, the, the vaccine doesn't affect people. Um, you know, very few people have any symptoms other than a, long, a sore arm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are people, oh yeah, they get the headaches and they get the this and that and the other thing, but most people just have a sore arm and some people don't have anything. You kind of almost wonder if those are placebos. Why would they do that, though? Yeah, that's the thing. It makes your arms sore. Yeah, when you take the vaccine, it takes, uh, you know, three weeks to kick in. But they say that the first dose is pretty strong, not just 50%, but more like some people in some reports, it says it's like 70%, even up to 80% effective. Um, so then you get the second one as a booster to make it up to 95. Hey, I, it sounds like the NFL... For the Super Bowl had my idea. They're going to allow nurses and first responders and so forth that have been vaccinated to go to the Super Bowl. How do you like that? I don't know if they heard my show, but... <laughs> my idea was for the NBA. Hey, well, I uh, hope you feel better, Barbara. Yeah, I know. I said that end of days. You're you're not you're not contributing to the conversation. Okay, we we know how it all works. I've explained it a thousand times. Now, when the Johnson Johnson one comes out, it'll probably be it's a one shot deal, but it's only they said only 75, 80 percent, which is really good compared to the flu shot. Yeah, well, of course, I don't think it's scary. I think people are going to have to get vaccinated to be able to go into places. You know, it's 
This isn't like the flu, okay? It's, uh, you know, way more dangerous when you get it. Well, it, well, actually, let's just say this. It's way more people catch this than the flu do. That does. You know, when, when, when the flu's out there, they hardly ever catch it. You know, it's just because uh, so many people already are vaccinated. This one is like 10 times more easy to catch. Yeah, I don't know what makes that scary. Oh, you mean, let, well, let me see if I misread what you said. Told her to treat it like her driver's license because show needed in the future. Show needed in the future. Yeah, you just say, hey, I've got it, you know. Like if you want to go to a, a basketball game, for example, you know, before the virus is completely wiped out, you probably have to say, hey, yes, I've been vaccinated, had my second shot, we're all good to go. Is that the part that's scary or what? I like last. I mean, you are last on to be able to go. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I see. It. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of sucks. I mean, they have this priority. <laughs> so, yes. Um, you know, younger, younger people might be the last people to get to go back to, like, NBA basketball games. Unless they realize that the vaccinated people are safe from the other people who are knowingly going to go to the game and have a potential of catching something, but they're doing it on their own risk or something like that. I, I don't know. I'm not really sure how they should do it, but we've, we've talked about this. You should be uh, deemed like an essential worker, though, Cairo, kind of like a grocery store worker. Uh, they're actually around people all day, though packed in a, you know, like in, in a line, so they're, they're actually in danger. Yeah, I think my wife gets her next one. Um, what's today? <laughs> Today's Friday, right? Man, I never even know what day it is anymore. Yeah, Sunday, I think she gets her second one. Yeah, I guess that would be kind of shitty, Cairo, having to wait that long. Hey, thanks, Billy Boy Blue. Can you tell all the girls who watch your channel to come hang out with me? Oh, God, here we go. Here's Billy Boy Blue again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were, you know what's funny is they were already up to 900,000 vaccines given out a day. And they're saying, we're going to try to get it up to a million. They were doing that right before the um, inauguration, 900,000. And it's like, hey, we're going to get to a million. Oh, wow, you got it to a million. Whoa. You know, get it to two million and give me a call, all right? Uh, oh, yeah, the Anadarko one? Yeah. I wonder what that one looks like. Yeah, yeah, he'll get all the credit for it. It'll be like, well, if we didn't do it the way we did it. But that's kind of how it always is, I guess. You know what really sucks is the, um, the signing of stopping the Keystone Pipeline. You know, all the environmentalists said it wasn't even bad for the environment. Canada wants it to happen, but it was purely done to just nix something, and it, and it, and it lost 10,000 jobs. <laughs> How ridiculous is that? Man? God. Yeah, it's just stupid. You know, it's, it's a, it was a vindictive... Um, executive order to cancel it. That's all it was. And Canada was like, no, we want it. We, we want the damn thing. Did you ask us first? Sucks. All right. So anyways, I'm going to get going on this uh, right now. The uh, Sumter County, Jane and John Doe. So I went back in time. You know how I normally do it. And I got a... Uh, 
found the articles in the paper when they were going on. Look at this. That's crazy. This is right where they were found. Bodies were, I think this might even be covering a body here. Looks like they lightened out some of that area. Um, sheriff are investigating the deaths of two young people found shot to death on the, let me get rid of my face. Dirt Road, Sheriff uh, Beard Parnell left, watches Sergeant Hugh Mathis make plaster casts of tire tracks. All right, so they're making, yo, know, you can actually see that. Look at that. Look at that right there. That's crazy. See that right? There's actually, right there, you can see it. The car peeled out after it dumped the bodies right there. And look at even right there, you can see that it went off and, hmm. The bodies of two unidentified young people were found early this morning on a dirt road between I-95 and US-3341. That was probably the worst description I've ever heard when I found it. Near the Florence County line, about 25 miles east of Sumter. Near the Florence County line. Is that right here? Where's Florence? Yeah, that's Florence. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if it's that close to that. See, this is, well, Florence, man. Well, anyways, this is the only place I could find Locklear Road right there. It's right here. It says South Locklear Road, but there isn't a north or anything. And it kind of looks like it when you go down there. It looks like a road that somebody would, I mean, another road that I was kind of amazed that Google Earth went on because it looks like that. It's dirt. And it, it does kind of look like the picture here. It looks, but it does looks a little wider though. I don't know. It's hard to say. Same types of trees, everything. It's in South Carolina, and obviously in Sumter County. Well, let's see. Where is Sumter County? I mean, Sumter. No, some Yeah, that's strange because that's not in some uh, Sumter. Maybe there's another Locklear Road. And it said near the county line. Let's see. So it goes like this up. So you, maybe it's up here. Hmm. Let's see. Locklear Road. I'm just doing, now I'm looking at this again because that doesn't make sense now that I look at it. Sumter County. No. See, there's only one Locklear Road in the entire state of South Carolina. So, you know, it's right there, but it doesn't, it's not in Sumter County. It's almost like there, maybe there used to be, like Sumter goes right up in here, and you wonder if one time there was an, it continued up into this area. Oh, anyways, it's in that general area somewhere, okay? I don't know where QB is, probably modding somewhere. Uh, let's see, both victims were described as being white and the, in their 20s. The man was about six foot tall, 150 pounds, with shoulder length, brown hair, and brown eyes. He was wearing blue jeans and a red chorus t-shirt and sandals. He was also wearing an accoutron watch and a gold ring and tiger eye setting. The girl was wearing a white blouse, cut off, jeans and sandals. She had medium length brown hair with reddish tint and bluish gray eyes. She was about five foot five inches tall, weighed about a hundred pounds. She was wearing a jade ring with a black setting on her right hand and a ring with a red and white 
blue setting and feathering with a jade insert. Both bodies were sent to the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston for an autopsy. Uh, Sumter County Coroner Benny Ratfield said an inquest into the deaths would be held after sheriff's investigations. That's on August 9th, 1976. And they, they weren't able to find the names, and obviously. Hey, thanks, Holly Evans. Sheriff deputies are still waiting for someone to give them the identities of the two young people found shot to death. Let me show you, I've got a picture here. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a picture if you don't wanna see it, then I'm telling so you sad. right now, okay? All right, so this is them on the ground in that area. These are all detectives taking notes. But they were just executed, dumped, and the person drove away right after that. So that was what they looked like on the ground. And here's another image there. It almost looks like she was shot in the neck right there. I don't know if that's... I'm just something on her neck that makes it look like that. I don't know. And then here's him on the side. So what's interesting is they have such great likenesses of them because it is them. I mean, you'd think they, they could have made them look really natural or as natural as you could, take taking pictures and then, then distribute it to all the newspapers everywhere. Who was slain on Locklear Road? They were both young, late teens and early 20s. Both were slender. He was six, six feet tall and she and weighed about 150 pounds and she was five feet five and weighed 100. He had shoulder length brown hair and brown eyes and she had medium length brown hair and bluish gray eyes. Uh, he was wearing faded blue jeans, a red Coors t-shirt and sandals. Uh, let's see, she was wearing three rings all sterling silver. I mean, the descriptions have been out there for a long time. Uh, where they died is also known as a dirt road known as Locklear Road between I-95 and South Carolina 341, about 25 miles east of Sumter. But until identifications of the two bodies are made, the search for the killers has been stalled. Investigators have been fielding telephone calls from people from as far west as Texas and as far north as Rhode Island. People who want to know if they might know the two victims, but hoping that, they, that the people they are missing weren't the ones found dead on a dirt road. Yeah, so the, a lady even showed up and thought it was hers. Murder victim still unknown. Now we're three days in. They were found early Monday morning on a dirt road known as Locklear Road between... I wonder what it is called now. I bet maybe that's just not even... It's obviously not the right road. They both died of multiple gunshot wounds believed to be fired from a 38 caliber 350 or a 357. Fingerprints sent to the FBI in hopes that their files may contain identification have not yet reached Washington. So the thing is, is they, I mean, this is still an active case now. Now it's more active than it was for a long time because they actually know who they are now. And I, they even have suspects, I guess. Search begins for identi identi identities of slain youth. Yeah. Let's see. Now yeah, they keep having the same description. <laughs> Let me see that first one again. I think it actually said Route 1, Box 175. So let's see where he lives. Route, Route 1, Indiana. Not Indiana, South Carolina. <laughs> so, been so busy on that other. Yeah, I found this crazy rabbit hole that I went on on, on the the 
LaSalle Street murders is crazy. Okay. That's US Route 1. Right there. Hey, thank you, Jessica Schubach. That was 1976. Thank you. All right, let me, uh, I'm gonna keep going through the, some of these articles here. Tip on slain girl followed. Investigator Hugh Mathis and Ron Boise in Georgia looking for a mother of a girl. Yeah, so they, they basically followed all kinds of leads. Uh, they got the FBI, got involved. They're, they checked to see if their fingerprints were already on file. They weren't. That tip didn't pan out that they got. Question still unanswered. Who was shot to death on Locklear Road? That is the key to the puzzle. The bodies of the young couple found shot to death in Easter, Eastern Sumter County two weeks ago. Hey, thank you, Jessica Schubach, Salty, and Shelley Wagner. These and other questions are being asked by people of Sumter and by investigators handling the case, but until the first question that that of the identities is answered the riddle of how and why of their deaths will remain a mystery yep love your dedication to the forgotten well thank you yeah. we need to have these bodies identified so we can get on with cracking this case said sheriff a uh, beard let's see yeah so they sent out an all points billet bulletin with all the descriptions what they were wearing and you know, many people in the area looked at pictures. Nobody could identify them. They were, let's see, the bodies were found the morning of August 9th on a dirt road known as the Locklear Road between I-5 and South Carolina 341. Both victims, see the thing is, is okay, so uh, uh, I-95, Yeah, so I-95 is right there. So just put a pin on that one. It actually goes all the way down into here. Then the other one is State High, you know, Highway 341. Ah, oh, okay. Well, there you go. That's right there. So maybe it's right there. That kind of makes sense. All right, that's where it kind of, so that's 341, and then like right here, kind of. And then that, look how close it is to the edge of the county too. Now you're in Sumter, uh, let's see. What, maybe right there? Maybe it's this Lynch's River Road now? I don't know, that's 341, so. Somewhere out in this area. That makes more sense because now you're right on the county line like they described. All right. I'll put that over there. Thanks, Rochelle Black. Because there's 95 and 341. They said between there. So it's probably like, you know, somewhere around in that area. All right. Makes more sense, too. Hey, thanks, Scott Holland. Show before midnight, East Coast time. <laughs> yeah. I'll be doing another one later, part four, uh, three of the LaSalle Street Murders. If you guys haven't followed along, I know it's kind of hard to catch up, but it's uh, Cheers, pretty crazy. Cheers, tumbler glass, clinking beer mugs, clinking glasses, tropical drink, 
cocktail glass sake <laughs> to a freak show before midnight east coast time appreciated sounds like you're having a couple drinks there uh, let's see one two three four five six thanks linda howell as in linda molden howe see i had a little earlier show just for you linda The girl was described as being very pretty with brown hair and bluish gray eyes. She was 5'5". Five five. The man was about six foot tall. Sheriff and investigators asked that anyone... I mean, they were just totally stymied. They covered it a lot to get people interested in it. And let's see. They covered it for... It went all the way up until like 1970, about a year later. Unnamed murder victims now lie side by side. Uh, first, they had an article, this one right here, though, that was, Will Couple Be Buried Unnamed? So they th they always thought that they were a couple. All right? So, yes, they, they were unnamed when they were buried. And when they were buried, they were buried side by side in a quiet uh, church yard. So they're in there, and I think it was just called, um, let's see what it says. With the quiet dignity of simple Methodist service, an unnamed young man and woman were buried Sunday afternoon. They were buried hundreds and perhaps thousands of miles from their homes at the church of Sheriff I. Beard Parnell, the man who is investigating their murders. More than 125 people, the, the curious, the compassionate, and the concerned, came to the Bethel United Methodist Church Sunday to mourn the two young strangers whose murder has not been found. Is there no relative to weep? Asks the Reverend Charles Kirkley. Is there anyone who cares? We committed them with the hope that someday, sometime, someone will come to this place and call their names. Then the silent secret that lies in the earth's bosom will be revealed. After a 15-minute service under a rain-threatening skies, the twin caskets were lowered into the ground. The plaques marking their graves were simple, male unknown, August 9, 1976, and female unknown the same day. That's all that was put on there. No cute nickname or anything, you know. Investigators and deputies from the Sumter County Sheriff's Department and coroner Bill Gamble served as pallbearers. Funeral costs are being paid by the people of Sumter County, and more than $300 has been raised, which back then was, you know, you know, probably that's probably equivalent to $2,500 or something. Parnell said he received about 75 in contributions Sunday afternoon. The estimated cost of the funeral is 400. Flower sprays draped across the twin metal caskets were donated by local florists and other concerned residents, sent flower arrangements and wreaths addressed simply unknown couple. The young man and woman were found August 9, 1976 beside Locklear Road near I-95 in eastern Sumter County. They were victims of multiple gunshot wounds. In the years since they were found, sheriff investigators have been conducting a nationwide search for their identities without success. Three dozen people have come to Sumter, some from as far away as New Jersey, to try and identify and claim the bodies. But after a year in airtight caskets, the two bodies deteriorated past the point where authorities felt a positive identification could be made and they decided to bury them. Well, hopefully he took about 100 great pictures, though. You know, you don't need to... The teeth of the dead man are now thought to be the best lead in the identities. Dental charts and x-rays will be published. Um, the gun used in the killing a revolver has been found. Wow. The gun used in the killings, a revolver, has been found, and its owner, a North Carolina man, has been questioned but not charged with the killings. Authorities feel that the key of the mystery of the I-95 murder lies in the identities of the victims. For once they have been named, 
many of the questions about their lot. Well, how did they? How did that guy end up with the gun? Maybe it was just he got the gun later. It's amazing they found the weapon. Though. Okay, well, their identities are known now. We talked about that the other day. And here is a press conference. Now, this guy right here, he's probably one of the most nervous people I've ever seen give a, giving a press conference in my entire life. But uh, it's still pretty interesting. They've got all the information in it. Uh, in the title... Hold on a second. What the heck was that? Finally, I can catch a live show high from the oh. UK Freakers, Boyds and Gray. <laughs> hey, thank you. That must have been through Streamlabs. <laughs> that was pretty good. I missed the name on that, though, because it popped up on a, a different place. Uh, so their names are Pamela Buckley, 25, and James Paul Friend. And let me show you what they look like. So this is her right there. And this is the guy. Obviously, he had longer hair now. All right, and I guess he was, you know, 30 years old at the time. And so here was one of the images early on, like this is her not alive. And, you know, then they, well, I don't know why they put this little flare of wavy hair in there. I mean, it's straight. Maybe she was found that, that way. I don't know. But anyways, that was one of the first drawings. And I don't, I don't think, I think this is so generic looking that it'd be, it would have been hard. Although, you know, you got the right nose and everything in there. All right. So anyways, let's get to the, uh, the press conference. Good afternoon. Today we are uh, case that uh, unsolved murders that we had 19. Is that, uh, you guys, can you hear that? I think you can. 1976, Sumter County Sheriff Officer was investigating. It happened on August the 9th, 1976. The bodies of two victims were discovered by a truck driver on Narrow Furnace Road here in Sumter County on Interstate 95. The victim. Now, this is one that I, I um, and it was only coming out of one side. So to avoid, hey, I, can, I can't hear it, I can't hear it, I can't hear it. I made it come out of, so it's um, stereo for you. Victims were a white female and a white male with no identification at that time. They both suffered multiple gunshot wounds. Photos of both victims were circulated nationwide for possible. I already mentioned the road, but I don't think the road exists anymore where the body was found. There's a road with the same name, um, like, the hell was it something Claire Road or something it, but the, the road doesn't exist so I just had to use what they described as a uh, an area so it was down here the other road was kind of like over here had the right name but uh, this one I think this one makes way more sense around in this area right here could could even be right over here since um, they sit in between here and there, so right around in this area, maybe this little road right here, 99. Yeah, it's hard to say, but the uh, the, na the name of the road doesn't seem to exist anymore, where the body was found. The name, the road itself, it says has a south in the front. I can't remember. I can tell you really quick though. Hold on. What was called? Uh, I think it was like Locklear, something like that. Yeah, Locklear Road. There's a South Locklear Road in South Carolina. It's near there. I wonder if that was a remnant road. Like I was showing you before. It's over here. But this doesn't fit the other descriptions. Not only that, it's in a different county. It's not in Sumter County. So right up here, 
uh, is in Sumter County. It also has the 95, I-95, and Highway 341. It said it was in between those. So it's either right there or like right around in this area. Yeah? What, what are you laughing at? <laughs> I'm confused. Oh, the saying hello. Yeah. Hello, yeah. Identification. And many leads followed with no avail. But in 2007, at the time our former Sumter County coroner, the late Vernon Moore, had the bodies exhumed to take samples for DNA extraction and identification. In oh, you know, June 2019. <laughs> Do you hear that music in the background? That was be that's what I, w I guess I was still playing when I recorded this. Ah, oh, Samples were sent to the DNA Dope Project. Yeah, the DNA Dope Project. All right. The DNA Dope Project has identified Pamela Buckley and James Freud. Through it as the most likely candidates for the victim. Buckley, the female, was born in 1951. At the time of the homicide, she would have been 25, and today she would have been 69. James Freud was born in 1946. He was 30 years old at the time of his homicide. Today he would have been 74. The families of both victims have been notified by the Sumter County Sheriff's Office on their identification of the victims. Our officer will honor the family's request for privacy in this case as well. The investigation of the homicides remain open and the Sumter County Sheriff's Office will continue to follow up on all credible leads. It is our hope that this news will bring the families some closure to what occurred in 1976. Because this investigation began many, many years ago. When I began my career with the Sumter County Sheriff's Office, at that time, Sheriff I. Bird Parnell, at that time, it was a priority to solve this case. And we were assisted by multiple agencies at that time. I'm out of North Carolina and our state law enforcement associate, our state law enforcement division as well. There were several who worked tirelessly to solve this case. I had the opportunity to work with many of the investigators that worked this case as well. And I recall some being the Lieutenant Hugh Mathers, Captain Bill Poulos, Lieutenant Ron Forsey, and many, many more. And I'm one of our forensic officers as well, Investigator Ray Mackesy. I wish they were here today to know that identification has been made on both victims. There were, and there still are, some persons of interest in this case on committing the homicide. I have and will officially open the investigation again into the homicides of both of the victims. Ms. Buckley, Mrs. Fro Fro Mr. Freud, I'm sorry. The, uh, our corner, Robbie Baker, will give the cause of death of both victims. Um, both victims, as reported, suffered three gunshots um, to the upper torso, one from the back and from the front. Um, but misreport, mis actually misreported, was that they suffered a gunshot wound to the throat. Um, both victims suffered the fatal shot. There were head shots from, um, from the back. There was an entry and an exit wound on both. Okay, because I saw that, that bullet wound on the neck. So maybe that was the exit wound. Um, the autopsy was conducted that same day, which that was 44 years ago. You're not going to get one the same day as you do right now, um, at MUSC in Charleston. 
uh, but both died from the fatal gunshots um, that were it, you know, delivered to the head. There was entry and exit wound, um, and I, I can't say much more other than the pathologist just did say that the gunshots to both victims were consistent to come from the same gun. As far as which caliber, we can't discuss because this is an ongoing investigation. My only hope is, uh, first of all, is to, to, the, to the families out there who well, had... Well, we already know the caliber. It was either a um, 357 Magnum, Magnum or what was the other number? 30, it was a... Uh, a struggle I'll, I'll find and it. endure with 44 years of not knowing where their loved ones are at. At least now they can at least put them, put them to rest. Um, and second of all, I hope that there's somebody out there in the United States that comes with a guilty conscience, has some memory of these two individuals, maybe an acquaintance, maybe a, 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 they might have seen them somewhere at a truck stop somewhere. Hopefully this will trigger somebody's memory or either trigger a guilty conscience to come right forward there. and contact the Sheriff's Department so that they can help solve. So there's a 38 caliber or a 357 Magnum. Um, but again, our thoughts and prayers go out to the families uh, and I'll be reaching out to them in due time because uh, of some paperwork that's got to be done. Where are you going, Tracy? What happened? But uh, I commend um, the former coroner, Ms. Moore, who actually did this ex exhumation in 2007, and the sheriff here and all of his staff that, that never stopped and haven't stopped and will continue to work on it. Thank you. Oh, you said so long. I also would like to add that uh, Ms. Buckley at the time was reported missing from Colorado, and Mr. Frog was reported missing from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And to just put emphasis on the former boss, Sheriff I. Parma Sheriff I. Parnell, he actually uh, had his church. She's originally from Minnesota, though, uh, Buckley is. She's from Minnesota, but was last seen and reported missing from Colorado Springs. To provide various spots for both, both victims because we were not able to identify either victim at that time. And then now I'm buried at the, uh, the Bethel Church here in Sumter County. Also, uh, we have uh, Mr. McDaniel, who's a also did some private investigation on this uh, case as well. We have worked, um, actually worked hand in hand with him in partnership with him as well. And uh, he has some, what he wants to add to the case as well. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is probably this guy's first time he's ever got in front of a mic and has to sort of speak like he's, he knows it, right? He's probably a detective, Get him on the side, he sounds totally normal. But, man, he is really struggling on, on this. Thanks, Sheriff. <clears throat> Good might, might be a while before they put him back out there, though. You're gonna have to give him some training. Uh, to get him up, uh, get him in uh, Toastmasters. Good afternoon. I'm Matthew McDaniel and it is an honor to be here today providing answers to an unsolved mystery that has mystified us for over 44 years. Over the past eight years, I have dedicated myself to solving this case. During that time, I attempted numerous methods to solve it, but ultimately it was genetic genealogy that cracked the case. More than anything, I am thankful that the families of the couple will have some closure now. I would like to thank the Sheriff's Department for their hard work and dedication to solving the case, or at least the identity. I can definitely tell you it's, uh, there is a learning curve. I mean, it took a while for me to be able to just kind of keep talking and I still don't do it that great, you know? So it is what it is. I don't, I'm not nervous anymore though. Uh, if you hear me stumbling and mumbling, it might just be that that's what I was doing that night. And for always being receptive to the leads that I provided. I've shared my research along with a list of potential suspects with the Sheriff's Department. I hope that the next press conference will be to identify the perpetrator 
who committed this horrendous crime. I would also like to thank the DNA Doe Project for their phenomenal work and for allowing me the opportunity to participate in the process. Hopefully justice will be served for Jim and Pamela. Thank you for your time. Any questions that you would like Look to ask? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I watched this the first time, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is, this, what happens to him right here, not to laugh, is absolutely hilarious to me because it, it matched so perfectly. Um, Oh, well, by the way, uh, I don't know if you guys, if you, ever, if you ever watch Fox News, there's a guy, uh, Dr. Siegel, that comes on. He was talking about, look how easy it is to put masks on, right? Listen to how funny this is. He's like, hey, it's really easy to put masks on, everybody. It's really easy to put masks on. You know, you just go like this and you go like this. And then when he did it, the mask got stuck on a button over here. And he was like trying to, <laughs> it's really, it's really easy, everybody. And he just kept going like this. Yeah, and, he, and then eventually he just made it really tight with this big part of the strap still connected to the button down here. It was absolutely hilarious, man. I mean, the guy, I felt so bad for him because it was like, the whole point was, look how easy. Yep, you just put the mask on. It's that simple. And here he is. He has it stuck to his uh, button. Oh, my God. That has to be a video out on YouTube because it was freaking hilarious. Look at this. Uh, watch, watch, watch that you would like to ask. <laughs> Ah. That was oh shit! True. Oh wait, hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Let's do this. I, mean, I got to do this in slow mo. Okay, here we go. Here it goes. Watch, watch. So it grabbed his glasses, flung those suckers off his shoulder. Oh, he tried to grab it, and then he's like, "Oh crap!" And then, uh, you know, I think now he's trying to figure out where the hell it went and where to put the. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I I just think it's funny. I don't care if, you know, I mean, he's a little bit nervous and everything, but you got to admit that's kind of funny. Any questions that you would like to ask? <laughs> wow. He's like, wow, man, what's going on today? Uh, that has been an investigation sometime. Uh, like I said, one of them from Colorado and one from Pennsylvania. And we still uh, we conduct an investigation now to see whether they were acquaintances or not, the two of them. Uh, like I said, both of them reported missing from those locations, but we hadn't determined the uh, Yeah, they didn't know each other before. So you see all these pictures out there where the guy's got his hand around her. I mean, maybe they started liking each other and they started traveling together, but they were both random hitchhikers that have met up at some point or just happened to be pick up, picked up by the same maybe truck driver or whoever picked them up at the same, you know, uh, one got picked up a hundred miles over here and then another hitchhiker got picked up again, something like that. Are the families planning to get the bodies that are buried at Bethel church or will they stay there? Like I said, they have been notified. I think they should leave the bodies there and just put a, a regular tombstone on it. And I say that because it was so cool that that community was so generous to do that. There was love there for them, you know. I don't know. That's what I would do. And uh, I got corner. Um, Baker said that uh, he would contact the families, and they wish to. Um, they would be able to remove the bodies from the graves from Bethel Church. And this case has haunted your department for about forty-five years. How does it feel to finally have some names put out there? Well, like I said, you know, to have some closure that we can provide to the families and you all know, you their loved ones that have been missing all these years. And, you know, with the new technology now, 40, almost 45 years, and, um, you know, to have been able to identify them and not only identify them, we do have persons of interest, too. I mean, it, and definitely going to reopen the case, and uh, we want to find out who actually committed these crimes. To my knowledge, this is our oldest case that we have. When you gave this news to the family after so many years, what was their reaction like? Well, uh, when I when the investigators talked with them, uh, yeah, well, 
uh, they were actually, I, I wouldn't know at this time. I'd well, that, they actually do know the exact caliber now, I'm sure, because they found the gun. It's not, they're not saying it here, but the newspaper article said it. I think they were finally, um, they knew that they were missing and they hadn't made contact with them, whether they knew they, they were, assumed that they were dead or not. They did not state that, but I think they were more satisfied or knowing that there was some closure in what, what had happened. Of course, they were upset when the cause of death was um, told to them, but they, they were um, pleased that we had uh, identified who they were and uh, where they were. Were they hitchhikers? I know we've seen that reported or, you know, that they maybe were seen at a truck stop. Well, <clears throat> there were a lot of, um, you know, we well, the one that did the, um, was Rebecca M., who did the um, Streamlabs ch uh, Super Chat deal. Trying to determine whether they were hitchhikers or maybe they had been uh, actually driving a vehicle. Um, we don't have a vehicle at this time to uh, identify with them, so we assume that they were with someone. Thank you, Holly Evans. A second. Oh, that was you? Oh, it was? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Gray. Uh, so that's your real, that's what you call yourself. But that, you just said that officially. Okay. Thank you, Becky. <laughs> and thank you, Holly Evans. Are you just talking about it? Talking about it, um, being placed on our um, website. No, there's, uh, there's like four Rebecca's. But the, I'm no, I'm just looking. The only one, your name listed on the document that I got on my email has Rebecca. So that's probably your real, you know, your official first name. Like if you have a, a an ID card, it doesn't say Becky on it, right? Um, certainly, um, Mr. Nathaniel, how he came about it as well, and how others have heard about it, it certainly helped with even with the social media as well. So yeah, that definitely played a part in it. Solving this case so many years later, maybe gives hope to other families from other cold cases. Yeah, yes, we hear that Sumter County Sheriff always always wanted the families to know they remain hope in solving all cases. Uh, we don't officially close any cases because we know with the new technology that we have there in this case, what it provided to us, there's always a chance to solve cases, any uh, cold cases that we have. When did you, you guys get them the DNA back in 2007? You gave the DNA to the brothers, or when did you give them that DNA, and how long did it take them to put this together? Uh, we confirmation back, I think it was maybe four months, five months ago, that we received um, confirmation back on the cases, on the identification of both victims. And I know you said that they were the most likely matches. Do we believe, you know, truly of trust and family, that this makes sense that this is them? After communicating with the family, um, we can confirm that these are the two victims that were uh, homicides on um, I-95 here in Sumter County. We will confirm there were the two victims. And I talked to the former sheriff's um, daughter, and she was saying that some, something like this just didn't happen in Sumter at the time. So just describe, again, how it's haunted you guys for all of these years. <clears throat> and that's why I think at that time, Sheriff Parnell was a priority to him, and not only Sheriff Parnell, the sheriff that had certainly followed this follow his uh, tenure as sheriff and myself. I mean, it's always been somewhat, um, you know, year after year and uh, there's always new technology. And when new technology come and uh, we always try to enter this case uh, with that technology and I use social media as one as, as well. Um, this has been a puzzle and like I say, things like that just didn't occur in, on, in Sumter County. Being occurred on I-95, um, they were not residents of Sumter County, but that was unusual to have happened in Sumter County. And where in Colorado was the um, one person from? And I know you said, where was the mayor? Where was the mayor? Yeah, the mayor, um, uh, James was from uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and the uh, female was from Colorado Springs, Colorado. And they were reported missing by their families at that time? They were. They were reported missing, both of them. How long were they missing? I mean, how many things? Since 76? Or what were they reported missing? And did the incident occur? Okay. Uh, she, uh, Miss Female was reported missing, I think, uh, 
after 1975, actually. She was missing after 1975. And I say the body was discovered in 1976. And also the uh, male, James, was also reported missing in 1975 in Pennsylvania. So they were reported missing the same year. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, because if she was reported missing in 1975, that means she'd already been gone for eight months. I mean, not already gone. I said that backwards. She was killed eight months after she was reported missing. So they'd already reported her missing way back. Uh, well, we don't even know if it was just eight months because it was 1975. So it could have been any time during 1975. And her body was found on August 9th, 1976. So that means it's minimum of eight months that she was reported missing and then she died. Do you have any idea where they were going? Where they were going? Yeah. There's some information that at this time we will not release in the investigation that uh, I stated earlier that we do have persons of interest um, that we have to. Uh, well, that, I, I would be shocked if they knew wh how, you know, where they were going. But he does make it seem like they might have an idea. You know, they probably have a suspect and they have a whole scenario built out. But as we all know that a lot of times that turns out to be bogus, right? They... Finally, DNA solves a case, and the guy that they thought it was all those years wasn't the one. Interview, and certainly we were working with uh, some other agencies, too. Why do you feel it's important to share this information with us today? Why is it important to get the word out and say, this, this unsolved murder has been solved? To some degree, we're still trying to work the uh, who is who is the what? Well, um, that's... The unsolved murder hadn't been solved, but the identification of the victims had been solved. Uh, we have been, uh, for some time now, uh, listed the, the victims as not being identified. And just recently, we were able to uh, list them as identified. And we knew once that was uh, listed on the uh, website that uh, there would be questions and so we also wanted to notify the family too of what was actually what what actually occurred, because the family has the right to know that uh, we had identified their loved ones. What took so long between the four months ago you got the identification and then wanting to come forward today to tell us their names? We were actually uh, making contact. I bet they. Well, I think they also wanted to do investigation behind the scenes, and then it didn't pan out. So now they need help from the public. That with the family members, uh, multiple family members. To uh, some were, um, were deceased, uh, and we certainly wanted to make sure that um, it was a confirmed disidentity of both victims, and that was one way to do it. Of course, the DNA was one way, but talking with family members gave us a positive identification. I got a question for the private investigator, if I may. I'm not a problem investigator. Why are you so interested in why is it so important to, to get involved in this case and help and solve this? Why does why, why it pique your interest and why is it important to get the word out for these folks? Um, why did this case pique my interest? Yeah, and why did um, you choose to get involved? Oh my god, it's the bridge guy, everybody! Look at the hat! Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think a lot of people were, were sort of attracted to this case due to the fact... And he's using the COVID mask to hide his real identity, everybody. Oh, we nailed it. That it was a couple that was murdered and never identified. So just the nature of the, the case, there's two people. And this is unprecedented that two people are murdered and never identified. And... Uh, I don't know. I was going to say that, but that's the overthinking and discerning light. The, the joke, would have, you know, of it, and it seemed very cold. I was like, uh, "Wow, well, uh, I'll leave off the weight part." What kind of drew me to the case? That's like thinking too much into the joke. Eight years. That's somebody too obsessed with the case. That would even think what's, of it what's so and say it out loud. Are you, are you from South Give us a little bit of your background. No, I'm from the Clemson area, so South Carolina. Me? Yeah. I mean, so you travel a lot down here. Well, I, I have an interest in missing person and unidentified person cases. Nice. So, Just sorry um, for saying it. Okay. 
I try. I look. I work on different you can cases. Think whatever locally. the hell you want. Like I said, mostly missing person cases and occasionally some unidentified person cases. A lot of times there is an overlap uh, in the unidentified person and missing person community. A lot of people what they try to do is try to connect, say, an unidentified person case to a missing person case. Um, so that's a lot of my passion is focusing on those cases. I did solve another case in Greenville, South Carolina, of a missing person a couple of years ago. And so I'm just kind of, right now, I'm not a private investigator, but I'm trying to work towards that. And I just like to, I'm just really fascinated and passionate about trying to bring closure to the families who have missing relatives. Okay, that's all the questions we uh sure, sure, if you do believe there's people out there that know something about <laughs> he didn't know how to end it. <laughs> crime stoppers or what do you, what do you do people know or this piece of interest in them and they, you want to get more leads to help confirm maybe some suspicions you guys have. Any more Certainly questions? we do do believe there are uh, all right, thanks for coming. Do you have any questions? that had knowledge of this case and they are actually called crime stoppers or call the Sumter County Sheriff's Office and uh provide the information to our office and like I said, we are actively investigating this case again. A viewer just messaged me and asked, uh, do we suspect this could be one of the Pee Wee Gaskins murders? I don't know much about that, but apparently they're saying that that was in, around the time they pick up hitchhikers off 95. We can confirm this was not related to the Pee Wee Gaskin murder. Okay. She was in jail. <laughs> okay, that's helpful. So yeah. just messaged me and asked, but figure it out. Do you think it's a serial killer that could do this, or do you think it's a, do you, do you guys believe this was an isolated incident because there was execution stuff? We believe it was isolated after that. Really? We do. Why is that? Thank you very much, Eric. Okay. Thank you. You know, what if they were all seen at a bar together or something? You know, like the two were at a bar, and that's why they have good information on it. Got rid of the gun, and they really couldn't pin it on him forensically, but they had a good suspect. Something like that. Who knows? All right. Well, that's it, everybody. That was the, the short live. And then t tonight, I don't know, probably around 8, I'll come back on again and do part three of the LaSalle Street murders. All right? <laughs> okay. So uh, make sure you, you guys continue to wash your hands. Uh, hope you can get a, you should claim, uh, tell them you need a vaccine, Cairo, if you're still out there. You're an essential worker, so why not? You should get one. So make sure you wash your hands, maintain your social distancing, and wear a mask. All right, so we'll see you guys a little bit later this evening. And as I always say, everybody, until next time. Be safe out there. Oh, wait. Hold on one second. I got to thank you guys. Let me do my... Uh, got to get over here. Thanks, Becky, over there on uh, Streamlabs. Thanks, Thanks Becky, Becky, on Streamlabs. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara Smith. <laughs> Billy Boy Blue. Ollie Evans. <laughs> Jessica Schubach. Sally, Shelly Wagner, Michelle Black, Scott Holland, Linda Howe, as in Linda Bolden Howe of the Cattle Mutilations, and Holly Evans. Trailer <laughs> I think I'll use that for troll alerts. All right. Anyways, see you guys later. Now, as I always say, until next time, be safe out there. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime deceptor. deceptor.
I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get you on a stretcher if you try and play me like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. Professor Quake is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector. And I'm always gonna be a pup protector. Fool the collector, interceptor. And I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his pector. With all respect, John. Just remember I've a temple for conjecture. I have no agenda, I'm the pretender And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender And in the end, I'm gonna send ya On a mission to reveal the true offender Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work Alright everybody, talk to you Alright, yeah, that was awesome, hey, cool, man, cool show, yay Okay, happy now? You gotta say it this time Yeah, I do feel a lot better about it Thank you, John boy, see you later Okay, See you later. Yeah, so it's good to see that the the identities of those two were made. The Sumter County Jane and John Doe. We'll see you guys later. Be safe out there.